Okay. Uh, uh, echo, 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 echo. Oh, okay. Okay, that's much better. Okay, um, so yeah, um, I'm RV Tuch, and today I'm going to be providing you a tour through the next generation Envoy Service Discovery APIs. This is uh, sort of collaborative work between Google, my employer, and Lyft, the famous Mac Line. And hopefully I'll be able to present the work of these folks in a good light as we go on a tour through, uh, as I guide you through these APIs. So a good sort of starting point for the Envoy APIs is what does the Envoy configuration look like today? Sure, I've talked a little bit about this. Um, in terms of where configuration comes from, there's really three main sources of configuration for an Envoy instance. There's the static JSON uh, file, which is read at startup by Envoy, it's provided on the command line. There's a hierarchical uh, runtime feature flags uh, tree on the file system, which is monitored via iNotify for dynamic updates. And this provides feature flags for Envoy, as well as the ability to override some of the parts of the uh, static uh, configuration. In addition to this, there's sort of dynamic discovery of resources by these XDS APIs, things like LDS, RDS, and CDS, and so on. And this comes by a REST polling um, from a, one or more management servers. So to just give you a feel, I think actually Shuram did a great job of describing what goes into configuration. We can actually just look at a, a simple example um, let me just, of uh, uh, concretely, and this is actually probably the smallest example of what an Envoy config looks like. And this is just a simple file which uh, config which tells Envoy to forward all requests from port 10,000 to google.com. And the config is a JSON file consisting of a number of resources, this is the idea of listeners which describe which um, IPs and ports Envoy listens on, include, uh, not in this example, but in general, this would also include TLS certificate information, includes route configurations, which provide mappings from you know, domains and paths to uh, services or clusters in Envoy parlance. And then from these clusters, uh, it provides a mapping to the actual uh, endpoints which we want to forward traffic to. Many of these resources are sort of discoverable by uh, the RESTful APIs which exist today, and there are five of these. Well, there are four sort of key discovery APIs and the rate limit service, and I include that because that's also part of the uh, the V2 uh, uh, work that we're doing. But I'm not going to actually dwell too long on this slide because I think that we've already had like a really good introduction to what each of these different kinds of uh, XDS services does. So jumping into the uh, V2 APIs. We had a number of like design goals when we went into this exercise. Um, you know, this is an opportunity to add things to the Envoy APIs to address um, new use cases, some limitations in the existing APIs. One of these was, and in particular at Google, is we're interested in supporting a variety of deployments for Envoy. So today, Envoy, you know, Istio is used, uh, let's say, as a sidecar. It can be used as a middle proxy. There are some things that uh, need to be done to make it a a better proxy to use on the edge. So we try to address some of these in V2. We were interested in looking at some, and I'll, I'll touch more on this later, different aspects of consistency for uh, API delivery and this uh, efficiency of API delivery. Uh, this polling uh, REST uh, the, uh, sort of meth methodology 
has you know um, additional latency due to the, the polling delay and introduces unnecessary load in, on, on the management server. We were interested in providing a migration path from the V1 APIs forward, but there are the sort of the key principle I think that we're working with today is that once the V2 APIs are in place, uh, the V1 APIs will be essentially frozen in time, and we're not going to really do any further work on enhancing the V1 APIs. V2 is essentially once we've switched these on in production, will be where new features get added. In addition to basic resource discovery, which is what the V1 APIs are largely about, we're also interested in adding feature ways in which Envoy can communicate back to the management server to allow it to make more intelligent decisions when it comes to things like um, endpoint discovery. And these include um, providing more useful information in the form of statistics and resource utilization um, uh, for load balancing, and also for health checks, providing the ability to have uh, scalable health checking. And this, is, this problem was also touched on uh, uh, just before. Finally, the V2 APIs are a great way for us to go in and clean up some of the technical debt that existed in the previous APIs. So why gRPC? Well, GPC, gRPC actually maps really nicely to many of the things we want to do in our APIs. All the sort of core APIs which exist in V1 today and still exist in V2 are essentially subscriptions. You, uh, you're declaring to the management server, I'm interested in this set of routes, uh, route configurations, this set of clusters. I'm interested in all the listeners I'm supposed to consume. And please push me updates when they arrive. The rest, you do this via REST, it has you know, additional overheads in terms of load, latency, you need to do uh, sort of, you need to jitter the request to ensure you don't storm the management servers uh, in a synchronized way. It's, yes, uh, you basically sort of avoid any of the, all of this by sort of switching to a streaming API. In addition, REST, the, the current sort of poll-based REST API is essentially a one-way communication. The management server saying to Envoy, here's an update, do with it what you will. In order to be able to do things like, for example, have Envoy say, I'm interested in the resources for cluster X, please send them to me. And then I will acknowledge whether or not I actually accept them, perhaps due to, you know, say, a configuration mismatch between the management server and the Envoy instance. Uh, you kind of need this sort of a two-way communication to happen between Envoy and the management server. In addition to communicate back things like loads of balancing uh, re, uh, and uh, sort of health check information from Envoy to the management server, uh, we need this uh, sort of two-way uh, stream to happen. And, that's very hard to map onto REST API semantics. You know, things like XMPP can do, have done this, but it's very tricky to actually get right, and gRPC is a natural fit here. The V2 APIs um, largely follow on from this sort of trend in the V1 APIs towards making things more dynamic. In fact, most of the resources that you're interested in discovering today with the introdu recent introduction of LDS can be discovered dynamically. You don't need to write a static JSON config file. It can really be quite minimal. There's still, though, significant overlap between uh, things that can be specified in the static JSON config, which is read um, at boot time, at, the, at initialization time, and what's delivered by APIs. In the V2 API, we're planning on making all of this essentially dynamic. We'll have a very minimal static bootstrap configuration. And even if you want to specify what, um, and configure Envoy by the file system, this will be consumed from a separate uh, set of files, which are monitored by iNotify in a similar manner to the runtime uh, feature flags. And these can be actually just you know, dynamically written to uh, and updated. In addition to that, we will have, as I mentioned before, streaming APIs uh, via JSON, uh, via, streaming APIs uh, via gRPC and Proto to uh, management servers. And for a subset of the APIs, we'll also offer a V2 REST API, which will also work with JSON, although a different fragment of JSON than the one that's used uh, in V1. This will essentially be the protos in JSON form. So the configuration story looks kind of like what it did with V1 with, uh, with a few differences. We have gRPC uh, between the management server and Envoy. And we also have um, iNotify sort of uh, watches of these configuration files and the ability to specify them as either JSON or Proto. 
there's kind of a bunch of sort of neat features we're trying to uh, also add in uh, v2. We would like to have versioning of all of these uh, API updates, and that plays a role in how updates are um, provided by the management server. Envoy will announce the version that it's currently running to the management server. The management server will deliver what it believes is the next version uh, that belongs to that Envoy instance. And Envoy is then able to actually act or knack by essentially reflecting which version was applied in its next message. We have added the ability to add metadata to uh, various objects in the configuration, which that can then be combined um, as um, a request match occurs, as you pass through the listener um, selection, then route to match, and so on. To be able to actually provide rich information in log messages and statistics and so on. We have sort of canaries of first class concepts and uh, for, at the, for configurations, not just for endpoints. So we could actually um, have uh, Envoy treat separate, uh, separately in terms of its behavior, in terms of what it's putting out in stats, what's going on when a, a, a configuration is being canaried. And Proto3 has become the single source of truth for uh, the API. Previously, we had a JSON schema and um, documentation written in natural language. We're now moving towards a, a world in which we just have everything written in Proto3. And that will essentially describe um, the gRPC APIs. It will also provide um, JSON uh, equivalents of all of these objects, because Proto3 is a canonical JSON representation. And we also plan on generating documentation from these uh, uh, Protos. These are all available on the uh, GitHub, which I linked to at the beginning on my first slide, and I will in a little bit. So in terms of how the APIs have changed, the most interesting ones I think to pay attention to are LDS and EDS. For LDS, and this sort of speaks to our interest in using this, uh, um, you know, in this these sort of flexible and uh, diverse co configurations, we've uh, made TLS context significantly more powerful. They can, uh, you can specify multiple certificates per listener. So for each port that you bind to, you can you could provide a bunch and use SNI or certificate type to select between them. We've added a bunch of uh, TLS features uh, to improve security there and uh, make them more useful. We've added um, the ability to sort of listen on actually a large swath of uh, sort of IP space. The destination IPs that you bind to and uh, listen on can now be uh, described using um, a very flexible scheme using CIDR prefixes and uh, suffixes. Uh, and each listener can actually have distinct filter chains associated with it. And these are selectable using these IP ranges, uh, things like source port, as well as um, SNI. RDS hasn't changed a ton. RDS is actually similar to what it was in V1, with the ability to uh, do some additional hash-based uh, affinity using cookies and a few cleanups. EDS is probably where things are actually most interesting. And EDS is actually a rename of SDS, the Service Discovery Service. This largely reflects some ambiguity and confusion in that name presented. Uh, EDS is pretty clear what's actually going on here. We're learning about the endpoints for a given cluster. The basic EDS API looks very similar to EDS in uh, uh, V1 of Envoy. But when you get into the more advanced features that, that can be opted into, it allows, for example, and I think there was a question about this earlier, the ability to load balance, um, not just equally across all endpoints in a particular cluster, but based on either some weighting or also to take into account their locality, for example, using their zone or region, or even like um, a sub-zone uh, um, specifier to uh, influence how traffic is weighted. There's actually a hierarchical uh, weighting uh, when, when load balancing takes place. We also support something similar to the label-based routes as a first class, um, label-based routes from Istio as a first class concept in V2. Uh, we uh, are able to essentially specify labels on endpoints as they're delivered by EDS and uh, have the route configuration specify which endpoints you're actually interested in uh, load balancing between. For example, you could say half my endpoint, or 10% of my endpoints are version B, while the rest are version A, 
um, and uh, specify A and B as, uh, in the uh, weighted clusters as provided in um, RDS or in the route configuration. And finally, we support uh, this sort of uh, stats reporting, which I'll talk a little bit about in the advanced API section. CDS and our uh, the rate limiting service barely changed. They basically just changed from JSON to Proto. So that's sort of the end of the, the, the core APIs. These are all available, as I had mentioned before, via sort of three mechanisms, file system, REST, and gRPC. The advanced APIs are gRPC only because they require two-way communication between Envoy and the management servers. First of these, uh, and the three of these, is EDS, uh, multi-dimensional load balancing. So the idea here is the management server might want to not just use, for example, the QPS, which you can grab from the stats today to make a load balancing decision uh, when assigning endpoints or waiting these endpoints. You may actually want to use things like CPU utilization and memory of the endpoints themselves, uh, as well as uh, you know stats that Envoy itself is able to report. With multi with the stats reporting for multi-dimensional load balancing, Envoy um, option and this is, this is sort of an opt-in thing. Uh, listens for um, HTTP response headers that are provided by endpoints, which actually include um, essentially these me uh, some some of these metrics, and it's able to then aggregate them for all endpoints, and then periodically report back to the management server um, both um, the stats that it can gather without the involvement of the endpoints, as well as the endpoint stats. And then the management server is able to make you know some intelligent load balancing decision using this information and supply this via EDS. So that's pretty much what it looks like. OK, health discovery service. So as you scale up the number of Envoy instances and, M uh, and endpoints, you get into today sort of an N squared problem of in terms of like number of health checks that are taking place, because Envoys are sort of uh, performing these health checks locally, and they're not actually sharing this information. And this presents a scalability problem. HDS is an API by which the management server can communicate with Envoy instances and assign them specific endpoints to health check, have the Envoy report back the health status, and then share this information with other Envoys, um, largely through the, the form of EDS by actually through the actual endpoint assignment. Only healthy endpoints are, are, are assigned. And the final uh, of these uh, sort of advanced um, APIs is ADS, the Aggregated Discovery Service. So a couple of times today, it's come up this idea that Envoy is eventually consistent. So what that means is, for example, if we take uh, receive a RDS update mentioning um, a cluster transition for some particular route, that cluster information hasn't been delivered yet by CDS or EDS. We'll have a period, pretty small today, uh, in which we, we're essentially going to drop traffic on the floor. By careful orchestration of these updates, it's possible for the management server to avoid this. And this becomes much easier if all of the APIs that are, are that are actually be delivered are coming down from a single management server, i.e. we have hard stickiness with single management server, and these are delivered on a single gRPC stream. And that's essentially what ADS is about. It's about muxing the various core APIs across a single gRPC FIDI stream and allowing a management server to then carefully sequence API updates to actually get something a little stronger than this eventual consistency which we live with today. And this is kind of important in scenarios where it's not acceptable to drop traffic on the floor. So this is pretty much what uh, you know, Envoy looks like today. You may actually be speaking with one or more management servers. I mean, you know, in the, in the Istio configuration and so on that we've seen before, is that this has actually been a single you know, pilot single management server. But in general, this is something which we're, we're going to see um, uh, in, in arbitrary Envoy uh, deployments. With um, ADS, we essentially have the ability to multiplex uh, each of these individual APIs um, on that one stream. So in terms of status, we've actually, we're actually at uh, feature completeness now. We, uh, we basically locked down the major points in the API, and these are up on GitHub. And we're actually working on implementing this in Envoy. And they're all, I mean, this isn't a complete freeze in the API. There's likely to be small changes as we discover bugs during implementation, things that are necessary for V1 backwards compatibility. 
V1 itself still continues to evolve since V2 is not the product is not in production yet. And so we actually have to chase a moving target there. We're working on um, adding support for uh, sort of the base infrastructure in, in, uh, to actually consume these APIs, and most of that's there. We have the EDS V1 subset implemented with CDS in flight of, of, of V2, and uh, Matt recently implemented LDS V1, which is actually a necessary precursor to LDS V2. This is what the sort of roadmap looks like, and this will probably uh, there's quite a bit actually involved here. This will probably play out over at least a year. Um, we're initially aiming to reach parity with V1, with the, with the basic APIs, um, add the ability to sort of uh, do uh, generate documentation, achieve the, something similar to what we do with the JSON schema today, add it in the bootstrap configuration. At that point, we should actually be able to run Envoy with the V2 APIs with the same set of functionality as V1. Following from this, um, because we have an interest of, uh, in this at Google, we'll probably add ADS as the next step, and then fill in some of these sort of additional features in LDS, RDS, and EDS, which uh, are actually sort of the defining features of V2. And then way down the track, we think like HDS is probably where we want to go. I mean, obviously, if someone's interested in ADS before, HDS before and is willing to actually go in and um, implement HDS, we would love that. So with that said, um, yeah, any questions? Yeah. No, at, at Google, we ha we're we building the internal cloud product. Well, we're building cloud products based on this. So yes, we're, we're, we're not using Envoy in a sidecar scenario. So it's closer to, let's say, the middle proxy uh, example we provided. Oh. I mean, for, for microservice developers, absolutely. You, you, you need an additional level of uh, abstraction there. Um, this is really for folks who are building, I guess, you know, of, of, great, of interest to, to things like you know, sequencing API updates and so on is the sort of the audience who are developing tools like Istio or actually, you know, for example, using Envoy as an edge proxy in the cloud offering or something like that. Right, so today Envoy pr produces um, a, a number of different logs and stats. Okay, so it, pr it provides HTTP access logs. It also provides um, just sort of debug logs, you know, telling you what's going on when, you know, warnings are triggered and things like that on, 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 on Envoy itself, which have nothing necessarily to do with the request, but have to do with the actual behavior of the Envoy process. It also exports out statistics via StatsD, um, which uh, are, are pretty flexible. Now, in V2, we're actually planning on adding in support for uh, pluggable stats and logging providers. Uh, the idea is you may actually want to send um, logs, not let's say via plain text to a text file, um, but instead via proto, or uh, be able to send out stats also via proto and gRPC to some arbitrary server, so instead of having to rely on statsd. Um, in addition, the idea is to provide the ability, and, and this is what this, this metadata point I touched on before, is maybe by annotating things like your routes and your listeners with just arbitrary labels and things like that, this provides a, a lot of insight into exactly what happened during a request match. So if you log, for example, um, uh, you're, you're producing HTTP access log, and you're able to produce some label which was uh, assigned during listener match and then during route match, maybe even that was used during the endpoint subsetting, that, that actually also provides some additional insight. Yeah. Uh, Let's just say that that, that that stuff's all in in flight right now. I probably can't talk too much about it. I'm not sure what we're saying publicly about that, but we, we talk to each other, yes. <laughs> I would say we should have this parity with V1 within a couple of months. Do you actually 
reach the point where, so maybe we will hit three or four within a couple of months. Hitting six is probably quite a bit further out and seven is off on the horizon. We don't have anyone actively looking at seven today. Right, so the idea is we'll continue to be, uh, allow V1 configs to be consumed by Envoy. We don't actually have a translation tool. What we have is code in Envoy which takes JSON objects and turns them into protos suitable to pass into the code paths where V2 is consumed. The idea is that as we, once we switch V2 into production, we feature freeze V1, folks will be expected to transition towards V2 by updating their configs. It should be largely seamless to many folks who are, let's say, using Istio or other um, abstraction layers where they don't actually need to manage these configurations themselves. Just in some Istio updates, it will start producing V2 configs. And uh, the, the Well, if, you, if you're building your own controller, essentially, no, you, you'll have to go off and uh, in, implement the V2 uh, uh, APIs there. Yeah, I mean, that won't happen until we essentially reach step three here. But uh, at that point, I, I, I don't think, let's say someone comes along with a new feature or wants to add a new configuration item, I don't think at that point we will add it to the V1 API. So there'll be a period which they live alongside each other, where it's essentially frozen in time. That's correct. Yeah, I mean, the, the key thing I think there is that the endpoint itself also participates in providing that information via these HTTP response headers where it's able to say, hey, I'm at 80% CPU and 5% memory utilization, that kind of thing. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I, I think that that would be a natural thing to do would be to factor that out, yeah, into, into a filter. Yeah. Okay, thanks.